Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna podcast brought to you by loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and this is episode 51. On this week's show, I'll be conducting an in-depth review of Unai Emery's tenure so far, and of course, talking Mesa Ozil. Joining me later on in the show is Claude from AFTV and Roman Molina, Unai's biographer, the author of El Maestro. He'll also be sharing his thoughts on the Spaniards' time with the club so far. And of course, we'll be talking about whatever else springs to mind during the recording. But before we get into it, if you are watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe. We're well on our way to 1,000 subscribers. We're around about 150 shy of that target. And I know that may seem insignificant compared to some of the other channels out there. But given that we are an audio podcast, and that's the format in which most of our audience enjoy the content, I think that's pretty good. Uh, So the aim at the start of the season was to hit a thousand and we're almost there Uh, so hopefully we can get there uh, come May sort of time Uh, if you are of course listening via SoundCloud or iTunes or any of the other audio platforms you can follow subscribe uh, do whatever it is that you've got to do and please please do leave us a review that really helps in leaping us or bringing us I should say up the ranking so please uh, do leave us those reviews So, Unai Emery, the story so far. Let's take it back right to when he took the job in in May of last year. And if we have a think about what he inherited initially, uh, you could say it was a really unbalanced squad. Um, You could say it was top-heavy, couldn't you? Striking talent in in Aubameyang, Lacazette, some attack-minded midfielders in Ozil, Mkhitaryan, Ramsey, etc. But clearly... We had issues defensively. Lauren Koscielny wasn't going to be back until sort of halfway through the season almost. And it was clear that Arsenal needed to do some defensive business, wasn't it? And of course, Unai Emery joined at a time of of real change. Sven Mislintat had been there a few months, but it was... At this point, we were supposed to see his influence increase. Raul Sanlehi would oversee all footballing matters. And Unai Emery's role differed greatly to that of Arsene Wenger's because he was to be the head coach, something very different to the old school football manager, uh, basically what Arsene Wenger was. It's a completely different role, uh, far less control around other matters. And it's just a focus on the team, isn't it? So let's look at the transfer business uh, that has happened since Unai Emery took over at the club. Lucas Torreira came in from Sampdoria for a fee believed to be in the region of 30 million euro. Uh, Bernd Leno came in from Bayer Leverkusen. Socrates Papastathobolos came in from Borussia Dortmund. Um, Matteo Guendouzi from Lorient. Denis Suarez has come on loan from Barcelona. That was in the recent transfer window. And Stefan Licksteiner joined from Juventus on a free transfer. So if I was to conduct a little bit of a mini assessment of the business that we've done so far, um, I would question some of that business. And I would ask the first question is, who was responsible for those signings? Did Unai Emery have an influence in those signings? If we go by the reports, it seems as though a lot of those deals were in the pipeline or done prior to Unai Emery really getting his foot in the door and really getting going at Arsenal. So that would suggest that the club's hierarchy made these signings. Would Unai Emery, and and this is the question I've been asking people this week, would Unai Emery have wanted... Socrates and Licksteiner, if he was planning to play out from the back, not entirely sure. Neither are particularly technically gifted. Um, I think the Gwendouzi one was a gamble, one that we'll look back on in years to come and, and, and say what fantastic business it proved to be. I guess at, you know, eight odd million euros or whatever it was, it's not really a, a big risk, is it? Um, considering sort of nowadays how much players are going for. Um, I've been asked by some of you guys on Twitter actually to rate the signings out of 10. So I'm going to do that. Um, and I want to know what you guys think as well. I want you to leave your ratings in the comments section below. If you are listening via YouTube, if not, you can tweet them to me. You can email them to me, uh, chroniclesafc at gmail.com, whatever you prefer. Um, 
So let's do that. Let's start off with the signing. So Lucas Torreira, um, I think when he first came into the side, he was fantastic. He was uh, energetic. He looked like he was a very disciplined player, willing to sit in front of the back four and patrol. And he looked like the player we'd been missing for quite some time. So I, I think he, he started like a house on fire. I do think he's dropped off a little bit of late. I don't think that's entirely down to him, though. I think that the team around him... Um, aren't performing obviously but also I think the selections haven't helped him I think the fact that he hasn't had a chance to forge a partnership with either Xhaka or Guendouzi because there's been so much change has had an effect on Lucas Torreira so I'm going to give Lucas Torreira a 7 out of 10 uh, in terms of his impact as a signing now Bernd Leno and this may be controversial I'm going to give Bernd Leno a 5 out of 10 is he an upgrade on Petr Cech he's an upgrade in the sense that he can play with his feet but all the other attributes of a goalkeeper. Um, sorry, when you look at all the other attributes of a goalkeeper, I don't think he's much better than Petr Cech. I don't think he's better at all, in fact. So for me, that's a 5 out of 10 signing. Um, I get why why the club did it. Petr Cech's obviously coming to the end of his career. He's retiring, as he's announced since. And I get it. Leno's got a lot of experience for a goalkeeper of 26 years of age. He's capable of playing with his feet, and that obviously fits in with the philosophy but for me it's not really been all that much of an upgrade so that's why I'm giving the Bern Leno signing a 5 out of 10 now Socrates this is a player I didn't expect much from if I'm being totally honest being from a Greek background I'd seen him play quite a bit for the national team and I've never been that impressed if I'm honest Um, he always seemed like a bit of a bruiser not much of a footballer I had this impression of him that he was slow seen some surprising statistics since he came to Arsenal that actually highlight that I need to get my eyes checked because that's not the case so in terms of how effective he's been since he arrived at Arsenal Football Club um I think it will be fair to give him an eight. And the reason I say that is because for someone to come in and, you know, slot into the team instantly like he had to is not an easy job, particularly in a defense that is notoriously poor, um, is, you know, we're very leaky in terms of the goals we concede. We concede for fun. I think he's brought a real passion, a bit of organization at times to this defense. I think the way to judge how important Socrates is to this team is that when he's not been available, we've really struggled. Um, he gives you a bit of passion. He celebrates tackles like he scored a goal. Uh, and this is someone who genuinely loves defending. I think if he had a better partner next to him, we'd see a lot more from him. We'd get the absolute maximum out of him. But when I look at the centre-backs that we have at the moment, he's probably the best one. And I didn't expect that when we signed him. You know, I thought that maybe Unai Emery would be able to get more out of Shkodran Mustafi. Um, I hope that when Lauren Kishoni returned, he would be better than he has been. But I guess that was that more in hope um, rather than anything else. The, if you think about it realistically, he was finished a while ago, as sad as it is to say. So Socrates gets an 8 out of 10 for me in terms of his effectiveness as a signing. Then we move on to Matteo Guendouzi. And as I mentioned before, this one was a gamble, wasn't it? 8 million euros. If it works out, happy days. If it doesn't, it's no big deal. Um, Nobody really expected anything from him. I don't think anybody expected him to play as many games as he has this season, having come from Lorient in League Two. Uh, So at 19 years of age, I think he's shown that he's fearless. I think he's shown that he has got ability. I think there's a little bit of immaturity still there, but that's going to come with time. Uh, I would give that signing an 8 out of 10 again, um, because whilst I don't think he should be playing every week, and that's a point that I make over and over again, that's no fault of his own. I think he's done well when he's coming to the team. I think he's shown that he's up for this and that he really wants to make a go of it. So, you know, can't knock the lad. If he plays too much, that's a gripe that I have with the manager, not him. So... Again, I'm going to give that one an 8 out of 10. Uh, Denis Suarez, I'm not going to judge that one just yet. It's a little bit too early. He's the next on the list as I'm looking at it. Uh, That was obviously a loan from Barcelona, 25 years old. Has struggled to get into their team this season and last season. So for me, 
Mm, it's too early to judge that one. So I'm going to skip that one. And I'm sure we'll come back to it in a future show. Uh, Stefan Lichtenstein. Now this was the worst signing of the lot. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. How you can justify paying this player £90,000 a week is beyond me. He has been awful. Uh, and that's me being kind. Um, he's he's slow. He's rash. He gets tangled up in, um, you know, arguments too often for me, uh, too, far too often anyway for somebody who can't defend. He needs to focus back on that. I feel like his shithousery uh, got the fans excited early on, but in actual fact, this is a player who is long past his sell-by date. I don't deny that Stefan Licksteiner was a good fullback at some point in his career, but you know he didn't play an awful lot for Juventus last season, and, that, and now we're seeing why. So... My overall assessment of the business, it is okay. You know, it's not, it wasn't bad. Um, you know, like I said, Torreira, Socrates for me have done okay. Uh, Guendouzi's done all right as well. But were there the type of signings that were going to guarantee Arsenal top four finish? No way. And that's kind of my issue. It was as if we were, um, we were searching. No, I wouldn't say we were searching because we don't know who we were really searching for, but it was as though Arsenal were shopping in bargain hunters. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you have aspirations of making the top four, you need to aim higher than that in terms of the players you bring in. So for me, when you look at the overall picture, yes, there's been some players that have done pretty well since they've come in. But when you look at the overall package, our overall summer business, it wasn't enough and it wasn't good enough. Now, the question is, who was responsible for this business? As I've already said, it seems to me that a lot of these deals were in the pipeline prior to Unai Emery getting to London Colney. So I'm starting to wonder whether he had any influence over those signings. Like I said, if he wanted to play a certain way, some of these players don't really fit in with that philosophy. So for me, uh, you know, I, I think overall it's not great, but you know, we've got what we've got and, and it's Unai Emery's job to get the maximum out of this group. Um, of course, the season began and to me, it was clear that Unai Emery wanted to flick between the 4-2-3-1 and 4-3-3 systems depending on our opponents and obviously, he wanted to have that flexibility to be able to make that switch during games and you could see that he was trying to implement a high press, playing out from the back was a must and after a turbulent start, which was expected, given the fact that our opening two fixtures were against City and Chelsea, we began to grind out results um, and, and improve slowly. And at that point, you know, I was fully on board with what Unai Emery was trying to do. I, I understood that the balance wasn't quite right uh, with certain players being in the team. Aubameyang and Lacazette couldn't play together at the start. The situation wasn't ideal. You want to see them both in the side. But I understood why Emery initially was reluctant to do that. I, like I said, not ideal, but I got it. I understood what he was trying to do. Of course, the unbeaten run continued, and even though the performances were not always there, as a fan, it's very difficult to complain, isn't it, when you're not getting beat? And I raised some questions over Unai Emery's style and that I felt at times we were too conservative, and it certainly wasn't as entertaining as some of the football we've seen previously. But... You know, during that excellent run, I could probably count on one hand the games we really turned up in. And that was the worry for me. There was always this overarching worry that was in the back of my mind that, yes, we're grinding out results, but I'm still not convinced by this team. And I've called that out on previous podcasts. I'm not just saying this now. Those of you who listen to the show or listen to me on any other radio shows or podcasts will know that I've been... Uh, and I don't think critical is the right word. I think that I've questioned some of Unai Emery's decisions. I've questioned his style. Um, and, and like I said, there's only a handful of games that we turned up in. Spurs, uh, Chelsea away, I thought we played well, even though we got beat. Fulham away, we were really good. Um, Liverpool at home was was a good performance too. But that was about it. During that run, we've since played really well against Chelsea. Um, but I'm talking about that run now. I'm doing things in chronological order. Then, of course, that defeat came at St. Mary's, didn't it? Where we lost 3-2 and the unbeaten run came to an end. But what you have to realise about that game was 
We were without Socrates, without Mustafi, without Kalasinac, and Koscielny had been rushed back into the side following his long-term absence because we were desperate. And in all honesty, my take on that was it's just one of those days. You know, we need to move on. We need not to overreact. And the run was always going to come to an end at some point. So, you know, the general consensus was we pick ourselves up and we move on. But my only criticism that day was Unai Emery's... De- and, and this is where I really started to get confused with Unai Emery's decisions. My criticism was, on a day where you only have one half-fit centre-back in Lauren Koscielny, why would you adopt a system that requires three of them? That made no sense to me. Granit Xhaka and Stefan Licksteiner played at centre-back alongside Lauren Koscielny that day, and it was a disaster. It was an absolute disaster. And I said it on the, the review show just you know, minutes after the game ended when I recorded it, that I felt that we would have benefited a lot more from having an extra man in midfield. That extra man in midfield would have given us the upper hand in the middle of the park and the game may have been very, very different. Now, I know hindsight is a wonderful thing and it's easy to look back on an event and criticise somebody, but I remember scratching my head when I saw that lineup. Why on earth would you play a system that requires three centre-backs when you only have one who's half fit, it doesn't quite make sense. But not only that, it, the fact that we'd been playing with a back four for most of the season made this even more baffling. It's not as though Unai Emery had come in, implemented this back three, and he wanted to stick to it, uh, and, and that was why he did it. It made no sense to me. So, you know, that was probably one of the first times I started to question properly what Unai was trying to do. I felt that there was too much tinkering. Um, And I know that, of course, injuries and suspensions, particularly in the defensive areas, have cost us at times this season. But it felt as though that after that result in particular, Unai Emery began to lose his way. He began to panic, if you like. And that tinkering that I've mentioned, it became more and more prevalent. You know, so far this season, and particularly since this game that I've spoken about, we've played with a back three, we've played with four at the back, we've played with a 4-4-2, with a 4-3-3, with a 4-2-3-1, and it feels as though there's just no structure to what we're doing. What is the vision? I can't see it right now. We've seen some really, really poor performances, and whilst I appreciate the situation Unai Emery's in, it just feels like we've lost our way. That vision is becoming blurrier and blurrier as the weeks go on. And surely that has an effect on the squad. Now, if you compare us to where we were at this stage last season, because I think that's a good barometer of, you know, how well Unai Emery is doing so far. If you look at the league, first of all, this season, we're in fifth place with 50 points. We've played 26 games, won 15, drawn five, lost six, scored 53 goals, conceded 37. Now, last season, at this very same stage, week 26, we were in sixth place. We were five points off Chelsea, who were in fourth, um, and we had 45 points. So five points better off this season, um, you know, that is obviously an improvement. We're obviously closer to the top four, but I think we're closer to the top four for an because of a number of circumstances, because of how the teams have done around us, because Chelsea are going through a transitional period, because Manchester United had such an abysmal start to the season. I think you have to consider those factors when you're making this comparison. Five points is not a great deal. And when you think about those five points, you could look back at some of the games where we perhaps didn't play so well, but managed to grind out a result or had a bit of fortune in order to get those results. And I think that's the difference. I think five points, you know, can easily be sort of made up with a bit of fortune. So I don't really like that comparison that much. I I guess it's a good starting point when you're comparing this Arsenal to Arsene Wenger's Arsenal, but it's not as black and white as that. I, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Because when you look at the cup competitions, I know Arsenal crashed out of the uh, third round of the FA Cup last year at the hands of Nottingham Forest, and that was embarrassing. But, you know, we're out of the FA Cup again this year. We made the final of the League Cup last season. We went out of that at the hands of Spurs this year. 
and we went to the Europa League semi-final. You've got to remember that. We went to a European semi-final. That's not to say that Unai Emery won't do that, but he hasn't yet. So I think you need to look at the, the whole picture when making this comparison and not just say, oh, but we're five points better off than last year because I've been reading that a lot lately and it's kind of getting on my nerves, if I'm honest. Now, let's talk about the Mesut Ozil thing. Uh, for me... This saga, this situation, scenario, whatever you want to call it, it isn't the sole reason for me doubting as to whether Unai is the right man for this job in the long term, but it certainly plays a part in my thinking. And I'll tell you why it plays a part in my thinking, because when I look at that group of players and I look at some of the players that Unai's persisted with this season, are they better than Mesut Ozil? Is Alex Iwobi better than Mesut Ozil? Is Henrik Mkhitaryan better than Mesut Ozil? In my opinion, they're not. And yes, you can question Ozil's attitude at times. Has his form been patchy since he came to Arsenal? Yes. But again, it comes back down to the fact that the replacements or or the alternatives are not any better. And that's what I'm struggling to get my head around. I thought that when Unai Emery came into Arsenal... It was obvious that we had defensive problems. We hoped that the signings we made in the summer were going to address those issues. We did sign a keeper. We did sign a right back, a centre back and a defensive midfield player. The hope was that we were going to improve defensively. But that obviously didn't materialise for whatever reason. Because maybe the players that we already had weren't up to it. Maybe the players that we brought in weren't quite up to it. You can argue that until the cows come home. But for me, I just think when you look at this Arsenal squad... You look at its strengths and its strengths are the two outstanding strikers that we have at our football club and an expert creator. And it feels as though maybe Unai Emery has handled this wrongly. Maybe he should have been looking to utilize what we were good at, get the maximum out of the forwards and, and, you know, go out and and attack teams. And, And maybe, you know, the Arsenal fans would have responded a little bit better to that. Um, you know, you can argue that we've had to be defensive um, in certain games because of the the personnel we've got, but we've still conceded those goals. So you just feel as though maybe you might as well have just gone out there and attacked and, and, you know, put on a show and taken the game to teams. And some of the draws that we've had this season may have been victories. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's all speculation. It's all, it's all ifs and buts, isn't it? But for me, Going back to my original point, I felt as though coming in, Unai Emery needed to make find a way of getting the maximum out of our stars, and then he could begin to build something. Once he got the buy-in of our stars and had them firing on all cylinders, the Urzils, the Lacazettes, the Abamyangs, and to be fair, he's done that with two of them, but it's, t- it's taken him half a season to do that because initially only one of them was playing. So I felt that that should have been the way he went at it from the beginning. And, and you know, maybe then in January, he may have got a little bit more backing. I don't know. I feel like the club are maybe a little bit reluctant to give him money to spend, given he's on a short contract and given that there really hasn't been a great deal of improvement. Going back to Mesa Ozil, though, um, and I know I've already said it, I don't believe that the alternative options at the football club are any better than him. But to freeze out your prized asset makes makes no sense from a business point of view as well. And, and, you know, I've heard people talking about Arsenal Football Club freezing him out on purpose in a desperate attempt to get him to leave. If that's the case, as fans, we shouldn't be proud of that. Mesut Ozil's done nothing to deserve that treatment. You know, yeah, he, he might not have performed in certain games and stuff, but to freeze out a, a professional athlete for non-footballing reasons, for me, is not good enough. That's unacceptable. That is classless. And I don't want to think that my football club would do something like that. You cannot seriously tell me that he's not good enough to at least be in the match day squad. You know, that 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 is the bit that I can't understand. I get it that you may not want to select him from the start away from home in a big game. I get that. I totally understand that. But to not even put him in the match day squad and to select the likes of Eddie and Ketia ahead of him. And this is not a personal attack on Eddie and Ketia, by the way. But the point I'm making is this is a kid who's proved absolutely nothing. Scored two goals against Norwich in a League Cup game once. And that's about it. Yet you feel, as a manager, that he can have a greater impact on a game than Mesut Ozil. For me, that is baffling. 
I cannot, for the life of me, understand that. I think Unai Emery's been poor in his man management of this situation. The lies he's told about, you know, tactical reasons and physicality. Football's not all about physicality, is it? I mean, that stuff doesn't wash with me. And it feels as though he's been disrespectful to the player. He's been disrespectful to the fans because it feels to me like he's lying and there is something going on there. And is it a power trip on Unai Emery's behalf? I don't know. Uh, Is he feeding his ego? I don't know. I I can't answer all these questions. I can only tell you what I think. And I think that this is a very harmful situation that we find ourselves in at the moment. And I think football is all about money nowadays. And if the club cannot move Mesut Ozil on and and it seems as though he's going to dig his heels in and stay it is all about money and I think that you know we'll see Unai Emery gone before Mesut Ozil is is pushed out the door and and you know I refer you to the Pogba versus Mourinho situation which took place very recently at the end of the day the club had made a huge investment on Paul Pogba they were not about to let that go to waste because of Jose Mourinho and in the end you know, it spelt the end for Mourinho, didn't it? And I think that there was disharmony at Manchester United. I think a lot of the players now, judging by, and I know you can't really go by social media too much, but judging by the comments and the stuff that they put on Ozil's post, it seems as though they're backing him. It seems as though they are, you know, also struggling to understand why Ozil's being left out of the side. So it'll be interesting to see how this one develops. Final point on it, though, um, have I said that already? Probably have. Sorry if I have. But my final point on it is I think that this situation is having an impact on Alex Iwobi. It, and you might be asking yourself why, scratching your head. How on earth can Mesut Ozil, being left out of the team, have an impact on Alex Iwobi? Well, I think that Alex Iwobi is a player who's not ready yet to play week in, week out. And I know he's been in and around the first team for a while now. But I think he's a player who's lacking in confidence. Um, I think he's a player who uh, needs to be uh, needs to have an arm put around him, needs to be guided quite heavily. He's not as fearless as, say, a Matteo Guendouzi. And I think that as every week goes by and Mesa Ozil's left out of the side, the more scrutiny there is on Alex Iwobi because he's kind of like his replacement, isn't he? And he's a young player who I don't think can take that the levels of criticism that he's getting. You can also say the same about Mkhitaryan, but Mkhitaryan's experienced. He's he's a big boy, he can handle himself, you know. He's been around the block a lot longer than Alex Iwobi has. But as every week goes by and Alex Iwobi doesn't perform brilliantly, and I'm not saying that that's the case every week because he has played well at times this season, but he's also had a few poor games. But the longer this Ozil thing goes on, the more people point at Iwobi and say, hold on. How is he in the team and Ozil isn't? And that extra pressure, that extra scrutiny is not helpful for a player like Alex Iwobi, in my opinion. I'd like to know what you guys think about that as well. Have you thought about that? Have you thought about the impact that this Mesa Ozil saga is having on other members of the squad? Let me know what you think. Tweet me at Chronicles AFC or you can email me chroniclesafc at gmail.com. Now, the next question is, do the club fully trust Unai Emery? And what I mean by that is, do the club believe that Unai Emery is the man for the long term? And when, when I say long term, it's not Arsene Wenger long term. We're talking about modern day football long term. And that could be three, four years. He was given a contract for three years initially, but there is a clause at the end of the second year to break that contract. Now, I'm not disputing that when Unai Emery was hired, the club thought it, he was the right man. But he was hired by Ivan Gazidis and that mob, which has since changed. You know, Mislintat's gone, Gazidis is gone. So does San Leahy believe that Unai Emery is the right man to lead this club forward? I've got a little bit of a theory, it might be absolute nonsense, but I personally don't think that Arsenal were restricted to spending in January because of, or restricted to not spending, I should say. I don't think that was because of FFP. And the reason I say that, there are loads of clubs out there who make less profit than us, have bigger wage bills than us, and they never seem to have an issue with it. So why is this a problem for Arsenal? I think that the club have looked back at the business that was done in the summer, 
look to the outputs from that business and I don't think they're too happy with it. And I think that, you know, they're giving Unai Emery this season and if he doesn't make the Champions League next season, I think that'll be it for him. I genuinely believe that. I think that Arsenal will pull the trigger if he doesn't qualify next season. So they probably looked at the business and thought, Let's have a look at this. How have we benefited from this? And the answer is not a great deal. I think we can all agree on that. I don't think that Arsenal's progress has been enough. I'm not saying there's been none, but I don't think there's been enough progress. So maybe their reservations about whether Unai Emery is is the right man have stopped them from laying money on the table um, in in the January transfer window. I know January is a difficult window anyway, but I think the only time we'll really be able to test this theory is come the summer. There were reports that Arsenal only had 45 million to spend. Everyone went into meltdown, blah, blah, blah. That's not true. Well, what if I said to you that even if there was money available, I don't think that the club are going to give it to an Emery. What would you say to that? Let me know. Tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC. I've got this feeling that Arsenal, as a club, since the changes that have happened in the recent months with Gazidis, Mislintat leaving, I don't think they're fully behind Unai Emery at this point. And I think that will stop them spending money or restrict them at least. I think that the way the season's gone, they're probably looking at it and they probably think that we don't really have a great chance of getting back in the Champions League. I know that we are only one point off fourth, but the way Manchester United's form has picked up, I'm not sure if we're better than Chelsea. Um, uh, And when I say that, I mean, they've got Eden Hazard and we don't. Um, So I think that they've probably looked at it and thought, you know what? We need to budget for the fact that we're going to probably be in the Europa League again next year. And, and a Europa League club's budget is is very different to a Champions League club's budget. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Let me know what you think about that little theory, though. Interested to hear your thoughts. Now, I don't want this to sound like an Unai Emery bashing session, because it's not. I don't dislike Unai Emery. I've got no reason to. I don't have any agenda against him whatsoever. He's never done anything to me. He's never taken a shit on my doorstep. I've got no reason to dislike the guy. So will people please stop tweeting me telling me that I've got an agenda against the guy that I've got no ill feeling towards? You know, I want Arsenal to be successful. I'm an Arsenal fan. I want what you guys want. So, you know, to suggest I've got an agenda for me is is completely way off the mark and and it drives me mad. I do have sympathy for Unai Emery uh, in a number of, around a number of things, around a number of subjects. I feel sorry for him because of the lack of funds. Like I said, right at the top of the squad, uh, top of the squad, right at the top of the show, I felt that Unai Emery was forced or the club were forced to shop in bargain hunters because of the money that was available. Um, So lack of funds to go out there and get top, top draw players. I think that Unai Emery inherited the shit squad. And when I say a shit squad, I mean in the sense of the overall balance of it. I think there are a few good players in there. Of course there are. There are some very talented individuals, but as a squad, it was very unbalanced. And so... It was a shit squad. I think his goal this season would have been to get back in the Champions League, and that is within touching distance. So, you know, you can't be too critical of him. Whatever the circumstances are that have led us to this point, it doesn't really matter. The fact is that Unai Emery is one point off the top four. I think whoever took the job after Arsene Wenger was always going to have a very, very hard time. And I also think that this league is a lot more competitive than anything that Unai's been in before. And of course, it's early, isn't it, in his tenure. So in conclusion, I want to give Unai Emery the benefit of the doubt this season, whether or not he achieves Champions League qualification. But next season is crunch time. I don't want to see him sacked now. Um, As I've already said, I don't have an agenda against him. Why would I? I'm just saying what I see. And it's not wrong to question some of his decisions. We're not puppets. We're supporters of this football club who pay our money to go and watch them. So we have a right to, to have an opinion. You know, people might not always agree with it, and that's absolutely fine. But I think... The reason I've been getting so much abuse on social media of late, um, you know, when I question him, is is a bit of a hangover from the Arsene Wenger regime. Because what's happened is, 
all those who were super vocal about getting arson out. Um, and when I say those who are super vocal, I mean those who were saying, fuck off, Wenger, pack your bags and fuck off. Thanks for the memories. Get lost. Um, you know, I, there was even some idiots. Um, I won't mention any names, but we all know who. They were going, I hope he dies. I hope he gets hit by a bus. I hope this and that. And I'm, what the fuck are you talking about? Those people are the problem now because those people that were so vocal, so abusive towards Arsene Wenger are now embarrassed to criticize this manager because this is what they wanted. They're in, almost embarrassed to ever admit that Unai Emery got any decision wrong. And it's pathetic, really, that, you know, these same supporters or fans as they, or whatever they want to call themselves who didn't think twice about abusing a club legend are now scared and have lost their tongues and, and can't speak one single bad word about Unai Emery. Drives me absolutely mad. But anyway, we're not here to talk about them. Um, but yeah, for those of you who, who keep tweeting me and saying that I've got an agenda, you need to check yourselves because I don't have any agenda against Unai Emery. Um, I never have. I say what I see when I watch a game of football and I've always been like that. And, you know, I like to think that my views are pretty balanced and I like to think that that's partly why this show has got to where it is. And, and so, you know, uh, it does, I'm not going to buy that. I'm not going to buy that. And, you know what? If Unai Emery does achieve Champions League qualification, I'll be the first one at the end of the season to praise him. And I can assure you of that. Right. We're going to take a short break. And when I return, I'll be joined by Claude from AFTV. And then following that, we'll have Roman Molina, the author of Unai Emery, El Maestro, joining us on the line all the way from France. Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, Claude. How are you, sir? It's been a while. How have you been keeping? Hello, mate. Hello, Harry. You're not too bad. I've got a bit of a throat problem at the moment, but I'm okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, I'm glad to hear you're okay, and hopefully it passes very soon and, and you're back to normal. Um, Claude, I just wanted to get your thoughts on the Unai Emery reign so far. Um there's been a lot of discussion about it, uh, particularly during this past weekend when we haven't had a game. Everybody's talking about Emery. Everybody's talking about Ozil. How would you assess Unai Emery's tenure as Arsenal boss so far? Well, when he when he first came in, I wasn't the greatest believer when he came in. But to be honest with you, Harry, and I was I was starting to come his way with this run but then I think I was a bit fooled by it this 22 game run um, what do I think about it uh, not impressed didn't, didn't understand why he named five captains uh, I think uh, for me Kishoni for me to me is past was past it in the summer I stayed by it stand by it I don't know why he was made club captain especially uh, uh Especially as he wasn't going to be playing until we're midway through the season. Uh, I couldn't understand it. I still don't understand it. I don't understand the pattern of play we're playing, to be honest with you. I don't understand what we're doing. I don't need, we, for example, going to Bate Boris off with five defenders and two defensive midfield players. I don't understand that whatsoever. Uh, the Messi Ozil situation puzzles me because he made him one of the captains of the side and now he doesn't rate him. Um, I don't know about you, but I think, although he does frustrate me at times, Ozil, I still believe he's uh, better than what we've got at the moment. I don't know if you agree with me, Harry, on that. Yeah, I do. I do, actually. I do. Yeah, and uh, what frustrates me is how many times, to be honest, have we played Ozil with Xhaka and Torreira behind him? Do you understand where I'm coming from on this? I don't think we've had many chances to do that, have we? No, and that's right. That's right. Of, and it looks like he's been made a bit of a scapegoat. Because if you ask me, we've got more. There's so many players here I'll have out the door in the summer that, that are not up to standard, mate. And this is this is where my problem lies. Is is the man? Is this coach big enough for the job? I'm not. I don't, I don't think he is, because the way he's handled the situation with Ozil is, is appalling. Yeah. If it, all right. If you don't you don't think he's good enough to play in the eleven, surely he's he's good enough to play in the eighteen. But um, 
what do I know, Carrie? I mean, that's what I feel. That's how I feel at the moment. No, I, I agree with you on most of those points. Um, I think that the the handling of the Ozil situation has been strange. I'm not entirely, you know, there's a lot of rumours, isn't there, that people are saying the club have instructed Emery to freeze him out in a, in a bid to try and get rid of him. But, I mean, if that is the case, that's not something that as a club we should be proud of, is it? Because Mesut no, Ozil no, hasn't done anything wrong. If it's not a football man, then the manager should resign as well. I'm not being funny. If it's not a football manager, if it's been told, oh, it's because it's... Uh, we got to get him, find him, getting him off the wage bill. Then the, the whole thing's a disgrace because uh, this is not why we should be behaving as a football club. And all this is carrying on about one player, right? And uh, it's, do you think? Look at all the other players in that team. They've seen all this going on. What the must they man, must be feeling? Do you Absolutely. understand where I'm coming from, Ali? Absolutely, and it, it feels to me like Mesut Özil has the support of the squad here, and. You know, I've I've already said this earlier on in the show, but I feel as though if it ever came to the point where the club had to choose between Ozil and Emery, given the, the financial investment they've made on Mesut Ozil, if they can't shift him, then I think that Unai Emery will be the one that gets the bullet first. I don't know what you think about that. Well, uh, to, to be honest with you, uh, yeah, I, don't, I mean, forget all that. Is he is he good enough to do the job? You've got to ask yourself. I mean. If we get in a situation like this, where listen, if we'd have won these games convincingly and uh, last few games convincingly, people wouldn't be saying they'll be saying it's okay. But you've got to win. If you're leaving, you're probably, uh, uh, and I'm going to get a lot of stick over this, but I think probably the best uh, player we've got uh, in in our in our squad. You're going to leave him out, and you don't get results. Surely you, you can't justify what you're doing. And uh, how can I put it? I mean, uh, it seems to me he wants to turn Ozil into Jordan Henderson rather than getting <laughs> the best out of him. No, no, I love that. I love that. <laughs> no, but it, it just why aren't we playing to his strengths and playing around to his strengths? He's our best player at the football club. You agree with me? Yeah, absolutely, Sadly, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So why don't we play to his strengths and get the get the uh, that defensive thing behind him sorted out, rather than worry whether he can comes back and and does it? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, is it is it or is it Ozil or is it the style of play that that Emery wants to play that's wrong? That's what you've got to ask yourself. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I'm yeah. For you me, cannot you know... tell me we're going we're going to Bate Borisov right with El Nenny on the bench, yeah. And Ozil's not in, not in the squad. Yeah, Are we having right. a laugh here or what? No, you're right. You're absolutely right. And for me, I just think as a new manager going into a job like the Arsenal job was, a job that there was quite clearly, uh, you know, lots of ground to make up. The team was underperforming. The squad was probably really imbalanced if you're looking at it fairly. But you would have thought that a new manager coming in would have looked at what he's got and said, right. This is what I've got at my disposal. These are my best players. I need to find a way of getting the maximum out of these guys in order to achieve my goals for the season. And then, once I get back in the Champions League, once I get the team firing on all cylinders... I can then build it the way I want it. Now, we knew that Arsenal were going to have a tough time getting into the top four. We knew that Arsenal couldn't defend. But from a neutral perspective, and I've said this earlier on as well... If you have given Unai Emery or whoever is calling the shots in terms of transfers money in the summer, they've bought a goalkeeper, a right back, a centre back, a cent, um, a defensive midfielder, and they've not improved defensively. You're going to start asking questions, aren't you? Of course, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, everyone says he's give him time, but he brought these players in, innit? We went to the we went to the Italian retirement home of Juventus to get our player, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, that's not good enough for Arsenal, is it? Come on, let's let's face it, yeah. Also, if we're not going to spend them, we're not going to spend the money and get get it sorted. And I'm going to ask you one thing: Can you see any identity in our football? Absolutely can not. You? No. Can you and see any pattern the way we're playing? No, and that's my biggest problem with it. My biggest problem is that we have. We started the season trying to play a certain way, this 4-3-3, 4-2-3-1, whatever you want to call it. And then after that defeat at Southampton, after that unbeaten run came to an end, it feels like ever since then, Emery's been panicking and chopping and changing and trying to yeah, find... Yeah, exactly. A, a if we'd have kept to what he was doing, 
I might not have a problem now, but why change it? Yeah. A few bad results and he changed it. That proves to me he hasn't got the bottle to be this top manager. And he's he's got a reputation on not being able to to play with players anyway with uh technically look at the uh with this uh, other guy. He had problems with Neymar, he had problems with Ben Arthur, didn't he? Yeah, that's right. You know yeah. what I mean? This is what I'm trying to say to you. Is he the man, and everyone keeps going on about, oh, yeah, give him time, give him time. But if you can already see it already, if you can't see an improvement, you've got to do something. Because I'm not being funny. We could say we could be here next year saying the same thing, giving time. We've done this with Wenger as well towards the end. Oh, give him another year. Give him another year. Give him another year. And we kept going down and down and down. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'm, uh, you know, I just want us to get... Someone here, you cannot tell me as well. You tell me now, anyone, and this is the problem here we had here. Who picked the manager? Because he is, didn't he? Yeah, it seems that way, doesn't Where it? Where is yeah. he? Exactly, exactly. Where is Gazidis now? Gone. That's right. Exactly. This is what I'm trying to say to you. I mean, who would come here with, on a two year contract with nothing to spend? and told to go to a retirement home early to get his players. <laughs> it won't be Allegri, will it? No, absolutely right. Absolutely you right. You know what I'm saying? Can, yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to get this after this conversation tonight. Oh, here he goes again. Claude is being negative. Never happy, never moan. No, I want to see my club move forward. That's what I want. And I will moan and moan until it gets forward. No, I agree with most of your points, Claude, I've got to say. Um, and yeah, just finally, just to wrap it up, Claude, in terms of yeah. Arsenal finishing in the top four or winning the Europa League, can you see it? Can you see Arsenal finding a way back into the Champions League come the end of this season? Well, they've got a chance. And everyone says, oh, it's over a season. But when you think about it, we're not. Because Man United were in, in a horrible state. We were 11 points in front. Look at them now. Yeah. <laughs> we're up against a Chelsea kind of who's in the transition. So it's not really an achievement to get in there. So if we don't get in the top four, it's cheerio, my friend. Do you know what I'm saying? There's no more giving, no more chance. If we don't get in the top four, we should have got in the top four this year. That should be a minimum requirement. Yeah. Chelsea are in transition. Man United were a mess halfway for the season. And we had an 11-point gap on them. Now, if he don't take a not taking advantage of that and he's out of the top four I don't want to hear that it's oh well we were up against it no it's cheerio yeah no uh, great views Claude as always thank you so much for joining me really really appreciate it and uh, hopefully we'll speak to you again before the end of the season and we can reassess uh, Mr Unai Emery's tenure uh, a, a bit later on once again so Claude thank you very much mate and uh, sorry about my voice but uh, <laughs> no worries at all no worries at all I hope you okay, feel mate. better soon anyway thank you Welcome back to the show, Roman Molina. How have you been, sir? Fine, fine, fine. Many thanks for the invitation, Ari. No problem. You're welcome anytime. You know that. Uh, Roman, I want to get your thoughts on Unai Emery um, and his tenure so far at Arsenal. Um, you know, there are some Arsenal supporters out there who are beginning to question whether this appointment was the right appointment. Uh, me being one of them, um, it's not to say that, you know, he doesn't deserve more time, but there are some questions that are coming to the surface now. What have you made of Unai Emery's start to, to Arsenal life? Well, first thing, I believe Arsenal is currently changing. Um, you know, last summer, everybody believed that with Gazidis, Miss Lintat, uh, Sanley, um, the club will be going forward. Uh, six months after that, Gazidis leave the club, Mislint that also. So it's a club who have to build again a new structure. So that's the first thing. And maybe the people didn't see it, but behind the scene is very, very important to have stability, to have a real project. So my, que my first question is, what is Arsenal project at the moment? You can talk about players, you can talk about managers, but I'm talking about the board. I'm talking about the sporting director. For the moment, there's no sporting director in one of the best clubs in England, which is annoying. Uh, second thing, um, when I'm looking at the players of the squad, Arsenal has a, I won't say weak, but if you compare to other teams of the big four or other teams like Everton, defensively, for example, tell me who's the best. I don't think Arsenal has, a, has an incredible squad. 
Uh, there's trouble, especially at the right back position. Bellerin is out, and you have absolutely no one. It's Maitland nice. Now you have to play because Lichtsteiner is absolutely, well, catastrophic in my humble opinion, and he's not the only one. Um, there are a lot of problem with that. Um, secondly, uh, I believe the Arsenal made some good games this season. Uh, the win versus Tottenham, the win versus Chelsea, the draw versus Liverpool. But away from home, it's like the other season. It's a disaster. So things didn't change. Um, now, um, I think Unai Emery is struggling a little bit to find uh, the best formation with the injuries, with um, maybe some key players missing. But so it's still work in progress. But I think the biggest question, biggest issue is where is going Arsenal? Yeah, Not it, only the player and the, the coach. Where is going Arsenal really now? Yeah, that's a fair point. There's certainly questions to be answered, uh, you know, by the Arsenal hierarchy. We've we've seen in January, we'd hoped as supporters that they were going to back him financially for whatever reason, whether it's due to financial fair play or, or the club just not wanting to lay out any more money this season. We don't know. Uh, but you're right to, to question what's going on from the very top because the project is unclear, isn't it? It looked as though we were heading in a certain direction. And since then we've seen Mislintat leave uh, and we've seen a, a shuffle round in, in sort of responsibility. So there are questions. You're right to highlight that. But in terms of Unai Emery's management, are you surprised mm-hmm. at how many times he's changed the formation, changed the system? And I get it that players yeah, have been missing. Yeah. But it's the you, first time he, it's the first time he made that uh, in Valencia. I remember a year he played three four three, especially with Jordi Alba as a on the left wing. Um, so yeah, I'm surprised because he's not the kind of manager who changes his formation all the time. Um, two things: the first is I believe he didn't find the right uh, balance in the team um, for a lot of reasons. It can be injuries or something else. The thing is, uh, the defense is very weak. Everybody and Arsenal know that. So if you don't protect the defense by two defensive midfielder, it can be a disaster. So I believed Unai, if he had Bellerin, uh, he would play at four at the back. Definitely. The thing is, he didn't have Bellerin anymore. And Morel was injured a lot of time. Kolosinac didn't defend well. So his main problem is not to score goals. Because he had Aubameyang, he had Lacazette, so, and, and other players who can build something. The problem is, when we don't have the ball, what we're doing? And um, it's a massive issue. So he didn't change that formation that much. He didn't make substitution at half time before that. It's a different way for him to coaching, because the mentality of the group is quite different from what he knows in Paris. He liked the group of play he had, definitely, because a lot of players wanted to improve, like Gendouzi, Torreira, uh, it will be uh, a lot of other players, uh, good players. But the thing is, he didn't find the right balance for the moment. So it's it, one of his faults, definitely. But in my humble opinion, the squad is very weak to yeah. To, yeah. to finish top four. To, uh, let's have to be honest. We're talking a lot about the issue with, with stars, especially with Mr. Hozil. I watch almost every personal game this season. Can really someone tell me Mr. Hozil was good, was really good? was Mesut Ozil. I think it's a shame because he's one of the best players I've ever seen in the last couple of years. And uh, the, the player I saw last season and this season is not Mesut Ozil, it is his shadow, which is annoying for him because I think he's the first really sad by his performance, especially the games against Leicester. He was very good, okay, except that game. Can we say Mesut Ozil was a different class this season? No, we, we, we probably can't. Um, and I, I agree with you in that sense that Ozil's underachieved. He's not performed to the level that we know he can. Because anyway, he played no. at the beginning of season. He played. He was a starter at the beginning of season. I mean, at the beginning of season, I remember Obama Young was benched two, three games, if I'm correct. He entered playing as a winger. Uh, Ozil was benched. Ramsey was benched. Lackett was benched. So that's Unai Emery way of, of, of managing, saying that Okay, maybe you can be a star, but if at the moment I believe you, uh, you're not performing well, this kind of stuff, I okay, I will give you another chance, definitely. But maybe for two games, I will give the opportunity to someone else. And that's why maybe players like Iwobi, Welbeck, uh, McTyron, or other were performing. The thing is, and I think it's one of his mistakes, it's the squad is very, you don't have bench in Arsenal. There's not a lot of professional players at the end of the day. So if you have one or two injuries, what you're doing? It's again the same player, the same player. So maybe it's one of his uh, of his mistake. But honestly, there's also tactical reason. I think when you see Lacazette and Aubameyang playing, 
from experience. He, he played with two uh, uh, strikers, but Aubameyang plays a real nine, and Lacazette is coming back, not like a number 10, but, you know, like an, in French we'd say nine and a half, you know, yeah. he, with his link up, etc. So if you put Lacazette and Aubameyang, okay, 4-4-2 or 3-5-2, okay. But you play 4-4-2 with Mesut Ozil. Mesut Ozil is not the best as a winger. I think we agree with that. Yep. So I think it's also a tactical reason because Ozil, his best position is number 10. But with Lacazette and Aubameyang, you have to believe, to, to think, well, my team will be balanced. Can I get some balance in that? And I think that's the main issue. I think, I really think that if the defense was better, Mesut Ozil will play more. Definitely. That's why Ramsey plays a, a little bit more in the last couple of weeks. Remember, Ramsey made a terrific performance against Chelsea, for example, in that position. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I just think for me, the issue with it all is that you can talk about Mesa Ozil, you know, maybe not putting in a shift, not working hard enough for the team. And and I, I fully accept the point about no, no, balance. It, I, it's I, not the problem of working hard about, about Ozil. It's about... He was free. I can assure you, I talked with some people in the staff at the beginning of the season. Um, they, they, they believe this is the best technical player in the years. Um, the thing is, he was playing number 10, sometimes on one side. It wasn't about defending. They know, they, 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 they give him the freedom to express himself. The thing is, he wasn't very performing with the ball. I, I remember Mr. Tosin made terrible technical mistakes. Um, I mean, he wasn't. Demise to Zil, everyone knows. So he was, I guess, maybe sacrificed for Alexandre Lacazette because Lacazette, as a, as a way of playing, uh, Lacazette gives a lot of good balls, you know. With his link up is great. And so if Ozil is not playing, it's because he wants to put Lacazette and Aubameyang uh, together. Uh, but it's not about Mesut Ozil doesn't work harder defensively on the pitch. Uh, that's it's that's not the reason. Okay, so let me ask you this then, Roman. If it's not because Mesut Ozil doesn't work hard enough, and it's not because uh, of that, and and that Emery and his team do actually rate Mesut Ozil, and they do feel that he is one of the better technical players in that squad. And uh, no, he's the best. He's the best. No, okay. one of the best. <laughs> he is the best. How do you explain? the fact that Unai Emery refuses to even put him on the subs bench for certain games. Now, you you cannot tell me that somebody like, for example, Eddie Nketiah, a young player who, let's be fair, and I don't want to judge the youngster too early, yeah. but he's not proved the thing yet. So how comes Ozil can't even find a place on the bench? What is that about? Has agree, there been yeah. a falling out? I agree with you. I agree with you. One of the main critics they have um, is the lack of physical condition. And it's not about defending, it's about being free when you don't have the ball. I remember sometimes Ozil was walking, walking around the park, uh, didn't make any difference. So the thing, the conclusion they have is that he has to be in better shape. He has to, to work hard on his fitness, because if he's better physically with the ball, he can do more difference, you know. So uh, there's two possibilities. I'm not in the, in the secret of the, the manager, but first thing, he did the same with Banega a couple of years ago, saying, hey, you're out of shape. You, you need to work on training. And until you're not fit to play, he won't play. He was his best player at Sevilla. He did that. And Baniga accepted. And after Baniga had a tremendous success. I won't compare Baniga and Ozil. Maybe they're quite different, but Baniga is quite a player, you know. He's playing World Cup. I mean, he's great. Um, so that's maybe one reason. The other one is to moment in, the, in his head saying, Mizut, I know you're gifted. I know you have plenty of talent. But I think you have to deliver more. So if you don't understand that, I will try something new. I don't know what the reason can be, but if he, if he bench Mesut Ozil, if he doesn't include him in squad, it's because he's thinking about something. Because if he don't want him, he will tell his board, sell Mesut Ozil. He never did that. So as weird as it can seem, but I, I, I know how he's managed because I follow him since 10 years ago. Um, I think it was like, all mentality saying, oh, move on you have to, to to make something or because he wants his player to be better physically i won't say that's a correct decision with mesut ozil because according to his psychology i don't think mesut ozil is good when he's on the bench yeah i think he's, he's good when he starts the game the thing is he tried sometimes to to put him you know after 60 minutes of games it was horrible to be honest it's not like ramsey ramsey can play even five minutes he will give it 100 percent ozil is like ozil is not that kind of player I think he saw that also. So maybe there's a third option that uh, if he knows that Mesut Ozil won't start the game, 
there's no point to to put him on um, as a substitute because he, I remember there was two games. Honestly, the attitude of Ozil was shocking. But I agree. I don't think it's a good way to treat Mr. Ozil. Uh, I agree with that. But if he did that, it's because we, him and his coaching staff think uh, to improve the solution of Ozil. He didn't want to sell the player. He never asked his board to sell Ozil, definitely. Okay, that's some really interesting some points really there. Interesting For me, it's it's... It feels as though, you know, a new manager's come into this club. He's obviously been tasked with getting Arsenal back into the Champions League, whether that's this season or next season. Um, he's come in on that basis. That's what he's there to do. And it just feels as though he's making life more difficult for himself by isolating a star. And, and I totally get what you're saying. There's lots of points uh, about Mesa Ozil that, you know, make it understandable when he's left out of the team and I get that but for me we just don't have anybody better at the minute and that's the that's the thing I'm struggling to get my head around and I think a lot of Arsenal fans are starting to find that frustrating because as weeks go by we're not creating a great deal of chances the football's not very fluid and you're looking at it and thinking surely Mesut Ozil can give more than what we're currently getting so that's where Arsenal fans are getting a bit frustrated but also the, the next thing I wanted to ask you, you know, we spoke earlier on in the season, uh, we spoke about your fantastic book, which we'll be telling our listeners at the end of this how they can get hold of. Um, we spoke about Unai Emery having a tendency to fall out with star players. It's happened before, hasn't it? Particularly at PSG. What can you tell us about that? Is that an ongoing Not thing? that because much. Yeah, for example, with Mbappé and Cavani, no problem at all. With Neymar at the beginning, it was a little bit hard because he considered that if you put someone to a ball from the other, saying, well, that's the man, uh, it can be a problem in dressing room. Is the man believed that you have to earn everything? Um, it's his way of, his mentality, the, the way he grew up, the way the way he thinks. Um, he hasn't got problem with stars. I mean, with David Villa, David Villa was a star. The two were very good friends. David Silva at Valencia, the same thing. Uh, and for me, the terrific players. But these kind of players had a different mentality. They were more team players. They're more like the old school mentality, which is, Unai is very good with that kind of player. Uh, after Banega was the, this big star in Sevilla, uh, sometimes they have trouble, sometimes they cry. Banega cried a lot of time in the shower because of what happened with Unai, but each time they were very, very close. Uh, I mean, uh, the thing is, with PSG, uh, if Mbappé came to PSG, it's because not entirely of, of the manager. And the two had a great relationship together. With Thiago Silva, not, definitely. But uh, it's not the first manager who had problem with Thiago Silva. Uh, with Neymar, at the end of the day, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad this film part of the season, honestly. They had some misunderstanding. Um, the thing is, with Funai, if he makes mistakes, sometimes he makes, I think he's making mistakes with Ramsey and Ozil, not only Ozil, for me, Ramsey had to play more, but that's my, my opinion. Um, he can accept the fact that he, he was mistaken. And uh, there's not a lot of managers saying, okay, what's my mistake? He did that with Neymar in Paris. Um, with Cavani, I told you there wasn't a lot of problem or a lot of issues. So, yeah, it's, it's an issue. It's maybe not, not the best manager with big ego stars, definitely. Um, but I really think they can sort it out. Um, the two parts have his, have his position. I understand why Ozil is frustrated. And I don't think it's normal that he's not on bench. I don't think it's normal that he didn't play that much. Um, but I'm very curious to, to understand why. It's not only just to say, well, he's not playing. The point is to understand why. And uh, as I told you, there's, there's some maybe hypothesis I, I gave you. Uh, and I'm very curious to know to know why, because trust me, at the beginning of season, Ozil was made captain, uh, he played a lot, he was started at every game, so the manager wanted him. It was not a case of, I don't want him in my squad. I remember Ozil came early from preseason in Asia, with just staff were very, uh, they liked that mentality. And after that, there was maybe a fallout in a way, a disappointment about his performance, disappointment about a lot of things. Um, but I think can be sold out because it, it will be best for Arsenal. I mean, Arsenal need Ozil, need a good Ozil. Yeah. And I, I don't think the manager is stupid to to believe. Well, we don't need Ozil because you don't have other players. The only you have is Henry Mkhitaryan, who just came back from injury. So and and they're, they're different. I mean, but is the only player I mean close 
to also in the way that he is a good passer. I mean, he yeah. made a lot of assists. He's, sometimes he made some mistakes, McTarren, but he tries hard. I think he's a good player, honestly. But he's the only one. Yeah, absolutely. So, Arsenal need Ozil. You made the point about the captaincy that he made Mesut Ozil a captain earlier on in the season. Do do you not find it confusing that when he does play and when he has played in certain games, he's been given the captain's armband despite not being in Emery's sort of, uh, you know, first team plans? Does that make sense to you? These are the things that we can't get our heads around as fans. Oh, yeah, because at the beginning of the season... There were some meetings and, uh, uh, well, the captains, well, the captain is Koscielny. And after that is Ozil and Chaka. So he, he won't change that. Even if the player is not, not playing a lot, in the, in the group, he's still the vice-captain. Because if you, uh, uh, imagine it, you say to Ozil, well, I drop you off the, um, the, um, the captain also. Right? It, will be, it will be horrible for him. Saying, well, I'm, I'm, I'm shit. The, the manager don't believe in me. So... Emery, Emery give his word that will be this year Koscielny or Silchaka that's it Okay, he won't change that um, because imagine what will be the effect for the player for the player even if he's not playing when he's playing he's captain of the team so if he's strip out the captaincy saying well now you're not anymore it's, it will be broken for forever so uh, they, they choose that for that year so they will, they will stick keep going it. yeah and yeah. just just finally, Roman, just finally, how do you think Unai Emery is going to get on? I mean, can you see him getting Arsenal back into the Champions League? Will it be this season? Will it be next season? How do you see do this you, whole you, thing panning out? Do you think any English team going to the Champions League with Stefan Lichtsteiner? With <laughs> no, no to, 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 to be honest, um, because as Berlin is injured, now we have in Arsenal, I mean, Arsenal, not Burnley, a central midfielder, 20 years old playing as a right back yep. because you don't have other options. You have to play almost all season before Koscielny with Mustafi Socrates. I mean, a classic match at left back. Yeah. So with that back four, can, I think Burnley has the best back four, to be honest. Crystal Palace has maybe an equal back four. So I think you can go to Champions League with that kind of kind of team. In the midfield area, okay, we have Chaka, Genduzi, Torreira. There's not bad players, but there's not star players. Yeah, you understand. And if someone is injured, what's happened? You have only two central midfielder and Mohamed El Neni is maybe more limited. Yeah. So I I, I can understand the, the impatience of Arsenal fans, but let's be realistic. Compare your squad to the Chelsea squad, to the City squad, to the Liverpool, to United squad. I mean, take. A lot of players in that team on the bench, they will start at Arsenal. They're better than the player. Now you have Iwobi. Iwobi is a young player. He has, okay, sometimes he makes something awful on the pitch. Okay. But he's getting better. The thing is, it's not normal that Iwobi is a starter at Arsenal because there's no other players who can challenge him. He's the only one winger. I mean, you Arsenal don't have any winger because McTyne is not really a winger or this is not really a winger. So that is it normal. So that's the point of what I'm saying at the beginning. What's the project in Arsenal? You can put every, every coach on the world. Can he do best with Lichtsteiner's right back, Kolasinac at left back, honestly, defensively? Fair point. That's why he choose the, the three at the back. Yeah. That's why he choose that. Because he was too weak defensively. And especially with the fullbacks, because Kolasinac has a, has a real power is when he's going forward. It can be terrific at times. So you, you have to use the qualities of your player. I, that's why I told you the, the injury of Bellerin was the worst thing for Arsenal. Even with Holding, Holding was at a good season, uh, yeah. in my opinion. And when Bellerin now injured, he had no one at right back, and Bellerin was terrific, especially offensively. I remember he made some really good moves as a player. The best goal Arsenal scored is because also of Bellerin. Yeah. So it's very, it's very disappointing for Arsenal to lose Holding, to lose Bellerin, uh, Welbeck also because Welbeck will have some minutes, you know, for cup games, all this kind of stuff. Like you don't have anyone. If Aubameyang is injured, what's happened? Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're spot on. You make some great points, Roman. Some great points indeed. Do you want? So I think Unai is not perfect. Definitely yeah. making some mistakes. I agree with that. But he's not a wizard, and you can put all managers on earth. I don't think they can change the situation. And the situation is as simple as that. What is a project at Arsenal? Yeah. And if the fans can understand that, I, yeah, let's be realistic. Let's be realistic. Let's compare what's the club in the last 
transfer window made with Arsenal. I mean, the squad now is not that good. You have a lot of young players. You can't expect Maitland Nice to be the top right back in the Premier League. Maybe it will be in a couple of years. The same for it will be. But for the moment, it's not because the, the young players will grow up, grow up, grow up. So I, I, I don't think you can be Arsenal awesome, that kind of player. I mean, Arsenal for the moment, with all the respect I have for the club, is a European League team. Yeah. No more. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe it sounds horrible for Arsenal fans, but let's be realistic. Put your players, each player in Arsenal 11. Can they play at Liverpool and Manchester City? No. No, they can't. The, 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 the back four, no. The goalkeeper, no. In the midfield area, well, maybe we can have... Not sure, but the, I mean the, the equal. And offensively, I mean Liverpool has Salah. Does Arsenal has one player better than Salah this year or Mane? No. Absolutely. So let's be realistic. Spot on. Roman, thank you so much for your time. I know you're Not really you. busy, so I really, really appreciate it. Not Do you want to let our listeners know how they can find your book? Because it is a fantastic read um, and it sort oh, of okay. sheds some light on Unai Emery. How can we find it? Yeah, well, uh, on Amazon, uh, you can uh, have it, Unai Emery El Maestro, and also by the website of the editor, Taste from Publishing. So there's these two ways to, to get the book now. So there's no, no problem. There's also an ebook version now. So. Oh, brilliant. You can have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have no problem. And just if I can add something, I'm not here to to say Unai is the best. I, I never did it. Um, I just try to, to think about something. I'm, I'm not friendly with him or this kind of stuff, you know? The thing is, I, I work a lot to, about him, about the players and sporting director. We know him. Uh, honestly, everyone was excited about his uh, venue to Arsenal because everyone believed that he was uh, the good man for that job because it's a difficult job. There's a lot of young players, this kind of stuff. So um, I'm not here to say he's the best. I'm not here to say, well, he's right with Ozil. I don't think he's right with Ozil. But at the end of the day, I don't think his work is that bad. Yeah. Because let's be realistic. I remember you made a terrific game against Tottenham, a terrific game against Liverpool at home, a terrific game against Chelsea. So sometimes it happens. Sometimes there's something very good. Yeah, and but I, the problem is you can't play away from home the way you're playing. You're Arsenal, for God's sake. And I remember some poor, not poor, very, very poor games away from home, especially with lower teams. And that's the, the problem of the players and the manager. Yeah, and I think for me, just finally, just to add, my issue with Unai Emery is not so much, um, you know, that. I get it that he doesn't have the resources there. He doesn't have the squad there. My issue has been that I've I've, I've struggled to see the, the plan. I've struggled to see the system. I, I don't quite understand where we're heading. He wanted to play 4-2-3-1. Four, four, but then he's abandoned it, hasn't 10. he? But he's abandoned it since, and that's my... Yeah, because, because, because he had the trouble of balance, uh, especially with the fullbacks. I mean, the key point this season, and was Bellerin was injured. That was the key point. Because he has absolutely no one as right back to cover that. And each team that playing Arsenal is watching, we will play uh, against the left back and the right back because they're very weak defensively. So at the beginning of the season, when he played at four at the back, it was Montreal who played at left back. Montreal defensively is better than Kolasinac. So you don't have a team saying, well, we only put uh, our wingers making all the balls there because they're very weak in that area. After that, the thing is, uh, he found that like the Tombami Young is a great partnership. The thing is, if you want to play with two strikers, he wants to make that. But which players can I put to, to give them the opportunity to, to shine? So he made the choice with Lacazette because he believed Lacazette was one of the best players on the, on the squad. Uh, and after that, with all the injuries, um, he's very disappointed not to have his best formation in his head. He, he wants to play a certain way. The thing is, uh, with the injuries and all that stuff, he, he didn't do it. For a problem of balance, that was the problem. But his first fact, 4-2-3-1. Even to put Obama on the left side. Yeah. He believed that. You know, Obama on the left side, like the top, Ozzy number 10, Victorian at right, at right uh, midfielder, and two defensive midfielder, Chaka Torreira. That was his fact. Did it work? I remember some games at the beginning of the season. No. So after that, he believed 4-4-2. I think the best formation in Arsenal is 4-4-2 this season. With Ramsey, maybe. You know, like uh, when you play against Chelsea. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think maybe that's the way he wants to, to make things now. Um, I, I think but that's yeah, the you thing, agree. Though, Roman. It, that, that's the thing, isn't it? It's 
for me, if a manager has a system in his head, I want to see it implemented. And even if you're not initially getting the results, you kind of understand what it is they're trying to do. You you see the vision. And I think, you know, when Klopp came to England, we had the same thing, didn't we? Where he wasn't really getting the results initially. The balance was a bit wrong, but you could see what he wanted to do. And I think a lot of Arsenal fans have the issue with Unai that so far we've seen so many different things, so many different variations. And the reasons are, for what you've said, I agree for a lack of balance, for not having certain players available. But that lack of vision is starting to worry some Arsenal fans. I think that, that's the yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. He, he didn't make that in the in the last teams. With Paris, he had an idea. And, uh, well, with uh, some players in Paris, he didn't want that, you know. So after a couple of months, it didn't work that hard, uh, that, that good. So they made a meeting and uh, the players expressed themselves, saying they're more comfortable in 4-3-3, free, free, that kind of stuff. So Unai adapted himself. <laughs> He's adapting his method to his players. He's not the kind of manager saying, well, we'll play that way or there's no other way. It's kind of, you know, it's like a democracy, he's saying. He's listening to his players also. Um, so I don't know. I'm not behind the scenes. Uh, if there was conversation with his players, I definitely think there were. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm curious. It's curious because he didn't make that. Except a year in Valencia, uh, where he changed sometimes the system. He's not the guy to play it from the back. He made only ones because they're terrific fullbacks, like Alba and Miguel. Yeah. So I'm very curious because I don't really get it also why now he's doing that. Uh, I imagine he had his reason. The thing is, I told you I watched a lot of games this season. I don't believe Arsenal was great. I don't believe Arsenal was, was, was shit. Average team for the moment. And it's the fault of the manager and the players. Um, but definitely, I really think the, the key moment of the season is the injury of Bellerin. Trust me, maybe it sounds silly, or oh, just a right back. Yeah, but this right back made a lot of good for a team. No, yeah. and you have no one who can replace it. Absolutely no one. Lifteina is so poor. I'm sorry for Lifteina, but Lifteina is so poor that each team look at look at Manchester City. The only attack Lifteina, Lifteina, and all the goals came from San Lifteina. So. Um, <laughs> So it's very annoying, the right-back position in Arsenal. I know he wanted a right-back for the transfer window in this winter. He couldn't have one. And I think it's maybe one of the be- the worst thing in Arsenal for the moment. Hopefully, Mason Nice can can make his, this position uh, get better. Yeah, absolutely. Roman, thank you Roman, so, so much. No, to you. And uh, we hope to speak to you again soon. Yeah, with pleasure. Harry, many thanks. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Right, just before we wrap things up, uh, we have been putting a series of polls out this week on the Chronicles of Aguna Twitter page, uh, which is at Chronicles underscore AFC. So do give us a follow if you're not already. And I'm going to read off some of the results of these, um, some interesting results. Uh, The first poll that I put up was, for this week's show, we want to know whether you as Arsenal fans believe Unai Emery is getting the maximum out of this group of players. Now, surprisingly, actually, 40% of you said, yes, he is getting the maximum out of these players. They are poor. And 60% of you, so the majority, said, no, he can do more. So I'm not alone in thinking that Unai Emery... Um, could be doing a little bit better with what he's got. Uh, That's not to say that he won't achieve the goals at the end of the season, but at this current time, that's just the way I'm feeling. And I think it's fair to feel like that. Um, And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, as long as those opinions are portrayed in a respectful way. And, And I feel that, you know, a lot of our fans have portrayed that in a respectful way. I haven't seen any of this abuse or that, that Arsene Wenger used to get last season or anything close to that even. Um, so yeah, so 60% of you feel that Unai Emery can do more with this squad. Uh, and I tend to agree with that. But if you disagree, of course, you can tweet us. No problem at all. Tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC and I'll read your tweets out on the next show. Now, the next poll that we put out was, should Mesut Ozil be starting versus Barte Borisov and Southampton? A resounding 86% of you said yes. That's how many people want to see Mesut Ozil back in this side. 86% of the voters. um, And that poll is still running, so you can have your say on that one too. And the last poll uh, is in relation to the reports that there was a, well... 
not that there was a bid, but that there is interest from PSG uh, in the services of Matteo Guendouzi, and they're looking to register a bid of around about 60 million. Um, we don't know how true that is, but I thought we'd put a question out, a hypothetical question. If PSG were to offer that sum of money, 60 million pounds, would you sell Matteo Guendouzi? 34% of you said yes. 66% said no. Now, I voted yes on this. I would sell him. And it's not because I don't think he will turn into a great player. But I think given the situation at Arsenal at the moment and the, the size of the rebuild that is needed, um, I, I think we could do a lot better with that money. That's all. Um, but 66% of you said no. So, um, obviously a fan favorite, all that Matteo Guendouzi. So fair play to him. Huge. Thanks. Of course, to every single one of you who voted in our polls this week, uh, a couple of them are still running. So if you haven't voted yet and you want to do head over to our Twitter page, uh, they should be quite near the feed. I haven't pinned any of them because I can only pin one and I don't want to get one pinned and not the rest it's not fair is it um, so if you scroll down you'll find those uh, they're not too far down the page uh, luckily the chronicles of aguna twitter doesn't tweet as much as me uh, personally and that brings us to the end of another episode a huge thanks uh, to my guest claude from aftv hopefully he feels a little bit better soon he's got a bit of a sore throat as you probably noticed from the interview uh, so thanks very much to claude and thank you once again to the brilliant roman molina uh, unai emery's official biographer uh, that's what i'm going to call him from now on i think roman sharing some real insight into the man himself uh, and the way he thinks and and you know, tries to shed some light on what may be going on at the club. So massive thanks to Roman too. And uh, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to hit the like button, follow, share with your friends, whatever it is you need to do. We'll be back on Friday uh, with a, this week's preview show. It will be on Friday this week because we are playing on Thursday night. That second leg of Barte Borisov in the Europa League is coming up uh, around the corner so we will be touching on that game and of course looking ahead to Southampton on Sunday until then take care of yourselves and each other as Jerry Springer would say meet our hero he's a smart guy who loves sports and loves outwitting other people our hero needs to show the world his mastery of the game. Our hero does this by playing games at Loserpool. Our hero is you. Loserpool has two games. In the namesake, the games of an entire season are grouped together into weeks or rounds. After paying an entry fee, you choose one team to lose that week or round. If you're correct, you earn the right to repeat the process in the next round. But the catch is that you cannot choose a team a second time until all the teams have been chosen by you once. If you're knocked out early, you may re-enter the same pool by paying a penalty to make it fair for the other players. Or you may wait until the next pool starts in a few weeks. Razor Pool is similar to Loser Pool in that the games of an entire season are grouped together. But in this case, you pay the entry fee and predict the outcome of all the games in that week or round. You will be ranked against all other players according to your accuracy. And at the end of each round, a predetermined percentage of players will be eliminated. There is no option to buy back into a pool if you are eliminated. <laughs> and so you will have to wait until the next pool starts to play again. In both games, the prize money grows very rapidly. The pool is allocated to the last man standing, or to add a little drama, to a small surviving group if they vote according to predetermined rules. Loser Pool is about community, friendship, fun and rivalry. Discuss and debate the games and events of the week with players from around the world. Invite your friends and co-workers into your own sub-pools and see who can outsmart the group and earn bragging rights. This is your moment. Create an account. Show your sports genius. Be the hero.